And it's finally released. Egypt's election commission announces the final results of the presidential runoff. Muslim Brotherhood's Mohamed Morsi is the winner with over 51% of the vote. He becomes the country's first president after the downfall of former ruler Hosni Mubarak. Morsi beat former Premier Ahmed Shafiq in the runoff. Iran congratulates the election of Mohamed Morsi as Egypt's new president. A statement by Iran's foreign ministry describes the election results as a victory of the Egyptian nation. It says the Islamic awakening in Egypt is now in its final stages. People in the Yemeni city of Ta'iz once again take to the streets to reject dialogue with the government. The protesters are angry at the members at some members rather of the uh, previous regime or in the current government. The new cabinet was formed under a power sharing deal backed by Saudi Arabia and the US. NATO will hold an emergency meeting on Tuesday to discuss the downing of a Turkish warplane by Syria. The meeting comes at the request of Turkey as a member of the Western Military Alliance. Ankara says the downed fighter was flying over international waters. Syria denies the claim. Dozens of Afghans are killed and many others are missing after days of flash floods in northern parts of the country. Authorities say thousands of hectares of farmland are destroyed. So far, hundreds of villagers are evacuated in the high-risk areas as a precaution against further flooding. American aircraft carrier USS George Washington joins a U.S. South Korean naval drill in the Yellow Sea. The nuclear-powered aircraft carrier is to lead large-scale military exercises. About 10 warships and submarines and hundreds of combat aircraft will participate in the drills. North Korea has been criticizing the military exercises. In the U.S., firefighters are struggling to contain wildfires that are burning out of control in two western states. Strong winds and high temperatures are fueling the massive blazes sweeping through Colorado and Utah. Hundreds of residents there have so far been evacuated. And tensions are running high in Bolivia. Mutiny by rank-and-file police spreads across the nation. The government is deploying the military to patrol the streets in the absence of officers. Police are demanding higher pay, but the government says they're setting the stage for a coup. History in the making. Egypt sees its first civilian president elected through a freely contested poll. More than a year since they staged the revolution that sparked a chain reaction across the Arab world. Egyptians are taking their first step towards change. But what are the challenges? I'm Homa Lesgi and this is News Analysis. <laughs> Thousands and thousands of people converge on the home of the Egyptian revolution to know who the country's next president is. And this is the reaction from a sea of Morsi's supporters at Liberation Square. The chants of Huria, Arabic for freedom. Thanks to God, the revolution succeeded. The revolution will continue. We are not leaving here. This is the result of efforts made by all Egyptians during and after the revolution as well as during the election. 
Egypt's election commission says Morsi won 51.73% of the votes in the June 16 and 17 election. And former Prime Minister Ahmad Shafir won 48.27%. Morsi is already receiving congratulatory messages from foreign countries, including Iran. What's next for Egypt? Morsi's election campaign has called for people to stay in the streets until the supplementary constitutional declaration is revoked. The declaration drawn up by the junta strips the president of most of his powers. As some people say, Egypt is on track toward democracy. Many others fear the constitutional powers the military has given itself will rob Egyptians of the benefits of electing their first president after the downfall of the former regime. With us now live from London is Chris Bambry, political analyst. Welcome. I'd also like to welcome our guest in Washington, Mr. Bill Jones, with the Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, gentlemen. My first question to Chris Bambry in London. Chris, do you think this is the start of a new struggle now with the military to restore the powers that the generals have now stripped from the presidency even before the victory was announced? Yes, I do. I think Mohamed Mursa has no alternative but to support this agitation for an end to the supplementary constitution and to what is now six decades nearly of military rule in Egypt. The military have taken themselves on virtually every power they could get back by this measure and have hollowed out any power the president could have in reality. We have a president who's been elected, Mohamed Mursa, but there are no defined powers for that presidency. There is no parliament because that's been prorogued and there is the body which is going to uh, select the new, uh, write the new constitution is being appointed by the ministers. If Mursa agrees to this, and the fact that the military have taken in effective control of foreign policy, defence policy, they retain control of the economy, then if he exceeds to any of this, then he is a president with no power. He has no option, I believe, uh, and I hope, but to continue this fight for real democracy in Egypt and an end to the military having, if you like, a say, have a hidden hand or an open hand in the say about how Egypt is governed and indeed much of the economy. This has got to come to an end. Hmm. Bill Jones, now let's have your view on this. Is this inevitably then, in your view, uh, about a power-sharing government, both uh, Mohamed Morsi having some powers and the military council inevitably having some powers, what we're speaking about now being how much power each side is going to have rather than the military going back to its barracks? Well, I think that's really going to be the situation as we go into the next few days. Of course, it was very exciting to see uh, the results in the street. I think people generally breathed a sigh of relief uh, that, uh, that he was elected, uh, that the election results uh, were upheld. But uh, all is not over yet. Now there's going to be, I don't think, I hope not a conflict in the streets, but there will be a battle uh, behind closed doors and negotiations between the new president uh, and the military with regard to uh, what the shape of the new Egypt will be like. Uh, I don't think that either side really has the, the power uh, to pull through all of the demands that they might uh, initially have. I think a lot of the measures that, uh, that were taken by the military will have to be walked back. Uh, but I think uh, it's going to be a period where there's going to be a lot of discussions, a lot of perhaps heated discussions on, uh, on what the shape of uh, Egypt's going to look like so that uh, although we have breathed a sigh of relief in one sense, there's still a, uh, a battle that's going to be conducted hmm. uh, behind closed doors and to some extent uh, uh, on the streets and in the media. Right. Well, we, we know right now that there have been negotiations between uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, as a party itself and Mohamed Morsi and the ruling generals we were hearing at least uh, parts of negotiations being about uh, possible power sharing. Chris Bambri, you have said in earlier remarks that you think the Muslim Brotherhood did make mistakes maybe at the early stages of the revolution and now is the time uh, for it to win the trust of the public back. So basically right now even some experts are saying 
saying these results were used as a bargaining chip between the generals and the brotherhood over the, the parameters of the new power sharing government. So would you go as far as saying that, that there has been, this is being used as a bargaining chip or, or would you say that the Muslim brotherhood, even if it's engaged in these negotiations, it is going to be able to win back public trust? No, I don't think it's guaranteed that it's going to win back public trust. I think the Muslim Brotherhood, after it won the presidential elections very convincingly, made a series of mistakes in essentially accepting that they will allow the military to retain the powers that it's traditionally had in Egyptian society. And it paid the price for that with the fall in support that we saw. Mohammed Morsi, I share a sigh of relief he's won, but... It's a narrow victory, and even in, in taking into account some of the figures you might question, it's clear that his, vote, his support fell and support for the Brotherhood fell. And that's the price they paid for making a compromise with the military and not pushing matters on when Mubarak fell, that it wasn't just simply a question of getting rid of Mubarak, but getting the, rid of the whole system, which has been in existence since 1952 in Egypt, of the military having this essential say over how Egypt is governed. And I think we're going to see two pressures coming in the Muslim Brotherhood. One is the pressure from the army. Army. The other is the pressure from the West, which is, uh, you know, I was just reading the Financial Times, we were coming on, coming on air, and they're saying that in, by and large they welcome the Muslim Brotherhood, because I think seriously they, uh, the Americans and the Europeans have agreed that this is probably the only alternative. But then they're saying that we want to see results on the economy, and by that they mean not addressing the, the poverty, 40% of the population on one US dollar uh, a, day, a day. They're not talking about that. They're talking about neoliberal economic uh, reforms, mm. and they're talking about retaining the deal with Israel. And so there'll be pressure from twofold, and Egypt needs IMF and European money in order mm. to keep the economy going. So the Muslim Brotherhood is going to come under pressure from different directions, from the SCAF and the military on the one hand, but also from the Americans and the Europeans, demanding that it plays along to their agenda. Mm. And then speaking about the stance of the Western powers, specifically the United States, Bill Jones, let's put this question to you. Right now, the reports that we're getting in the wires is a statement by the White House, and uh, it says that it wants, it considers Mohamed Morsi's government uh, as a pillar of regional peace. Rather, uh, it says that it wants uh, the Muslim Brotherhood candidate to be a pillar for regional peace. And it's also urged Mohamed Morsi to work towards advancing national unity when it comes to forming uh, inclusive, they say, government. So, first of all, do you think that this was a surprise for the United States government and they would have preferred Ahmed Shafir to win? And how serious are their concerns, especially when it comes to Israel? Because we know the Muslim Brotherhood stands against Israel. Well, look, basically the United States uh, government has been on uncharted grounds uh, over the last few weeks with regard to uh, the situation in Egypt. Uh, a lot of the discussions that had been ongoing, for instance, between the military and, uh, and, the, um, and the defense secretary, Panetta, when he was there, were kind of reversed when the military made their decisions about the, uh, the powers that, uh, that they were going to maintain. And so the U.S. has not really been on top of this at all, and there's kind of a, a wait-and-see attitude. Uh, trying to feel their way across as to you know what they are going to do as this situation proceeds. The statement from the press secretary today was essentially the initial statement. They did accept uh, the uh, uh, and greeted the uh, uh, election of Morsi. I, I don't think it was entirely a surprise. I think they were probably prepared for uh, anything to happen there. Uh, but when it did happen, of course, uh, they have to accept that the United States has been talking about democracy all over the place. And here, obviously, democratic elections were held. That's about all they could do. But at this point, they're really, again, on uncharted seas, and they're trying to feel their way forward uh, to see, uh, you know, what, what role they'll be able to play in this new situation in Egypt. They're calling for calm. Uh, I think the situation itself... Uh, right. kind of uh, pushes uh, Morsi in that direction. Uh, he, he got a clear victory, but there were, according to the polls, 48% of the Egyptian public that are pretty nervous about what's going on, and he really has to uh, establish himself as a uh, representative mm -hmm. uh, for all the people. I think that's going to be obvious if, if uh, problems are going to be uh, uh, avoided. But I think in one sense the U.S. is 
uh, playing a waiting game but trying right. to do something. They probably would have been, uh, they would have preferred, of course, if one of the liberal groups uh, mm -hmm. who initiated the, uh, the, the uh, so-called Egyptian Revolution had played a more major role, but they were kind of pushed on the outside uh, mm -hmm. at a very early stage. So after that, it was pretty much out of the hands of anybody in the U.S. to do anything here. Right. Uh, back to London, Chris Bambri. It is widely believed uh, in Egypt and among a lot of uh, political observers that uh, the United States has been with uh, uh, the military rulers and has been supporting the military rulers. Basically, that would imply that it would be supporting what the military council is doing right now in Egypt. If the United States is sincere about its stance uh, or on uh, Egypt moving toward democracy, opponents say, is it going to, for instance, speak out against this uh, soft coup, uh, I'm putting in quotes, that has been, uh, of course, uh, alleged that the military council is following? Well, I think you're right to uh, use the remark soft coup. I think that's what it is. And I, I think the Americans, if they wanted to, could pull the plugs on the Egyptian military very quickly. The military, uh, military are the second biggest benefactor of U.S. military aid. They couldn't really survive with, with, without it. But also, as I mentioned, the, um, the Egyptian economy is desperately in need of IMF and European Union cash. If that was not forthcoming, then they would be under pressure. We haven't seen that. And I think my colleague is right to say that the Americans have been, really since the beginning of the Arab Spring, have been caught off guard and have been reacting to events rather than trying to shape them. I think in the, the last few weeks, I think they've come to the assessment, essentially, that Morsi is going, was going to win, and really the Muslim Brotherhood are probably the best bet in terms of stable government. But of course, that doesn't mean they're going to stop there. They will put pressure, as I said, on Morsi to play along with their Western agenda. And there's going to be a clash over that, over the question of Israel. People in Egypt are opposed to the treaty with Israel. That's not often said, but every opinion poll and every uh, survey shows opposition to that. There is the expectations of people in Gaza, who we saw celebrating Morsi. And then there's the pressure from Washington and elsewhere saying that he should maintain the peace, peace treaty. There is going to be expectation in Morsi that he should deliver for the people who are living in poverty, mm. the vast majority of who supported him. And there will be a lot of pressures. The Americans will be countering those pressures. And one of the ways of doing that is using the military to play, if you like, a strategy of tension. We've seen this in so many scenarios that essentially the military help create a situation of seeming chaos. They create a situation of tension and then portray themselves as being the only people who can uh, pr uh, provide security in Egyptian, uh, Egyptian society. And I think we have to be aware that if Morsi doesn't play along with the military in the West, you could see a destabilize, an attempt to destabilize his government, his presidency, by the military and other forces. That's why I think it's of vital necessity that rather than trying to do deals with the military, who've reneged on those deals in the past, the Muslim Brotherhood and Morsi should be calling on those people who made the revolution to stay on the streets, the alliance that made that revolution to come together and to push for real democracy in Egyptian society and not to stop halfway. Hmm. Uh, back to Bill Jones here. I'd like to put this question to you as well, Mr. Jones, and that is, is Washington going to speak out when it comes to what role the military council is playing? Of course, the prediction is there's going to be confrontation, there's going to be some kind of clash, at least politically, between Mohamed Morsi and the military council. Today, we were even hearing that why did the military council uh, allow, or rather, the, the constitutional court, who is made up of judges who are affiliated to the military council, they said that those political leaders who were part of the previous regime can still be in office. That, they said, is unconstitutional. The fact that the parliament was dissolved, they're saying that was an unconstitutional decision because it was freely elected. Now, when things are heating up now as Morsi is coming to power, is Washington going to still side with the military council? Well, I don't think they can completely side with the military council, nor do I think they, uh, they have tended to do in, in the most recent period. Like I said, they, they had the meeting, uh, Secretary Panetta had a meeting with the military leaders, and I'm given to believe that uh, he was told one thing, and uh, when the, uh, the military instituted these extraordinary measures, uh, the U.S. also was kind of caught off guard by that. So uh, it, it's not necessarily that uh, this used to be the only game in town, of course. This is the way the uh, situation was set up, that the U.S. relationship with the Egyptian and other militaries was really kind of the central focus 
of U.S. relations with that nation. That's no longer the case. Now there are other players in the game who are very important, and uh, I think most uh, people here in Washington would deem it uh, folly to try and uh, just play the side of the military in this mm -hmm. case. I, I think there will be a tendency to try and find some kind of a solution uh, of an agreement uh, between uh, uh, President Morsi and the military on a lot of these issues without uh, destabilizing the, uh, the situation in Egypt. I'm hoping mm -hmm. uh, that will be the case, that, that reason uh, will, uh, will prevail in, in terms of that. But I don't think there's going to be any one-sided support uh, of the military and all their actions, and the U.S. will put pressure on them uh, not to do anything that, that would really destabilize the whole situation, which would be a disaster mm -hmm. for everybody. Yeah, well, today, besides seeing the celebrations taking place among Egyptians in Liberation Square, Chris Bambri, we were seeing uh, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, very jubilant indeed, uh, very joyous indeed. They were saying that for them, this is very important because they believe this is going to bring change for the Palestinians in the struggle against Israel. Uh, Mark Craig of the Netanyahu spokesman so far, he's uh, said that we're not going to say anything about our stance on the situation in Egypt. At the same time, uh, senior Hamas official Mr. Mahmoud Zahar has said, this is a historic moment, a new era in the history of Egypt, a defeat for the program of normalization, he said, and security cooperation with the enemy. So high hopes uh, expressed there by Hamas. Do you think that these are going to be realized? Well, there's an old saying that the road to Jerusalem lies through Cairo. In other words, Egypt is the key to the whole situation in the Arab world. It's the largest country, most important. And the Palestinians will be looking to Egypt for support. We should also recall that under Mubarak and previously under Sadat, that the, the other side of the boundary between, uh, of the Gaza Strip was policed by the Egyptians who played along with the Israelis. We shouldn't forget that. So the siege of Gaza was policed as well by the junior part of the Egyptians here. This has to come to an end. It's going to come to an end. And I can't see there's any way back to the Egyptians shutting the border with Gaza. That's got to be opened. There's racketing tension between Hamas and people in the Gaza Strip and Israel at the moment. There's a wider picture as well. There's going to be big expectations of, uh, of change. And there'll be sympathy, and there is support for the Palestinians inside, uh, inside Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood are right. going to face pressure, as I said, from America and elsewhere to maintain the treaty with Israel. Israel now has very important economic investments in Egypt as well, so that's another form of pressure. Mm. Their supporters will expect them to make that break and support the Palestinian resistance. Now, again, one hopes that the Muslim Brotherhood and President Morsi will go that right. way and not go the other way. Right. I'm just being told Mr. Walid al-Haddad uh, with the Freedom and Justice Party is now joining us uh, live uh, from Cairo to share his thoughts with us. Mr. Haddad, thanks so much for being with us. The question I'd like to put to you first is, can Mohamed Morsi now challenge the military rulers when it comes to the sweeping powers that they already have? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I'd like to uh, send my greetings for all Egyptian people and all the people around the world that now Egypt is a civilian country, civilian state. Now it's the first president after the revolution, the post-revolution president for Egypt, Dr. Mohamed Morsi. Now uh, uh, he is with the people in the street. He is uh, the people for the street also. He is the people for all Egyptians, not for freedom and justice parties, member or Muslim Brotherhood. He is now a president for all Egyptians. He will have the power from the people. He, uh, he, now preparing, he is preparing himself to satisfy people's needs through his position as a president for all Egyptians. Uh, I think there will be a great uh, participation from different political uh, parts and forces in Egypt uh, to support him in his uh, 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 second step after uh, the uh, declaration from the presidential election committee that he is the president. The second step will be uh, 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 with SCAF in order to uh, have his authority and right. try to uh, attract his power again uh, because now we are we are in a very critical situation now Mr. Haddad, if I could just stop you there if the, I may uh, uh, power is still in Scott's hands so we 
Yeah, Mr. Haddad, the question is, we are hearing of negotiations already taking place between the Muslim Brotherhood and SCARF. Can you confirm for us what these negotiations have been about? Are we going to see then a power-sharing government with uh, most of the power in the hands of the military and uh, restricted power for the president? Could you please repeat the question? Yeah, yes, of there course. Is some in yes, your, of uh, course. Right? Are there talks between the Muslim Brotherhood and SCARF over a power-sharing government with the military having most of the powers? Yeah, uh, uh, well, I'd like to say that there is no problem between uh, uh, SCAF and Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the, the, uh, uh, the race is between SCAF and Egyptian people. There is no uh, direct contact between Muslim Brotherhood and SCAF. Now, the, the direct contact will be from the president to SCAF. The president have now the power from the street and SCAF uh, must leave the, the power to the president and return to their position. When we are talking about Muslim Brotherhood, the relation now between Mohammed Murdoch and Mohammed Morsi, uh, Egyptian president, and Muslim Brotherhood has been ended. Uh, uh, Dr. Badia, the Supreme Guide for uh, Muslim Brotherhood, announced two hours earlier that there is no relation from now between Dr. Mohammed Morsi and Muslim Brotherhood. So, when we are talking about a very yeah. uh, a strong movement in the street like Muslim Brotherhood, we are talking about another political forces and actors in the uh, uh, political scene in Egypt. Okay, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Walid Al-Haddad, with the Freedom and Justice Party joining us there live from Cairo. I'd also like to thank Chris Bambury, political analyst in London. Thank you very much. And a big thank you to Bill Jones with the Executive Intelligence Review joining us live from Washington. I'm afraid we have run out of time for this edition of News Analysis from Miho Malezgi and the rest of the team until our next program. Goodbye.